I'd like to turn today's call over to your first speaker, Chuck Tomasi. Chuck, you have the floor. Hello and welcome to TechNow, the web series for ServiceNow at admins and developers on a wide variety of Now platform topics. It is great to speak to you today and I'm glad you're here for the live webinar or watching this later, wherever you may find that. This is episode 59. It's hard to believe we've been doing this almost six years. It's just been crazy fun and we are happy to be here. We are going to be talking about agent intelligence under the guise of work smarter with machine learning driven automation. And we have a special speaker for you today. I'll get to it in just a minute. My name is Chuck Tomasi, senior TPMM with the Now Platform. Been using ServiceNow for just over 10 years. There's another milestone. Whew. And it has been a wonderful 10 years, most enjoyable software development I've ever done in my entire life. Uh, I've been to this <laughs> coming up. We'll talk about knowledge in a bit, but we're coming up on 10 knowledge conferences in a row. Also host the uh, web series, uh, the community live stream, have a, a series out called Tech Shorts, and participate on Live Coding Happy Hour. So you can find me in other area places, as well as our online community. Uh, all of that is the funnest part of my whole job. And without further delay, I introduce to you Craig Stepp. Hello, everybody. I'm Craig Steff, and I uh, am a senior curriculum developer at ServiceNow, and I've been here for almost five years. I'm getting there. I'm trying to catch up to Chuck. Uh, hopefully, I won't quick. <laughs> so I work on uh, infrastructure lab. Labs are doing not or maybe you've taken some courses with us that are training and certifications. Uh, I do a lot of that back end work, a lot of the, you know, Lifting the, lifting the heavy stuff, trying to things make these things happen. And uh, I, again, I do not make the curriculum so much as I work on the, the back end and, and, uh, and all that good stuff. So, um, but that's me. Uh, I enjoy Linux and photography and uh, podcasting and podcast with Chuck and it's like much like I'm doing here. Hi everyone, my name is Stacey Bailey. I'm a principal curriculum developer in the training department. I've, uh, like Chuck, I'm a bit of a dinosaur. I'm trailing him by about a year. I started working with uh, ServiceNow in 2019, so I'm coming up on that 10-year anniversary. Just hit my four-year anniversary uh, with ServiceNow as well. So I uh, write curriculum and I develop applications to help us uh, organize the back end. That's me. And we've got a very special guest. I think this is who Chuck was referring to. Uh, <laughs> I thought that was pretty funny, Chuck. So a very special guest. And then up comes your picture. So um, <laughs> here is our special guest speaker <clears throat> today, Matt Train. There we go. Hey everybody, this is this is Matt Train. Uh, I'm a solution consultant here with, with ServiceNow. I'm the I'm the young one of the bunch apparently. I've only been with ServiceNow uh, for about a year and a half, and uh, I work here in the field uh, on the on the West Coast. Actually, I live in California, so uh, if you if you're here on the West Coast of the United States, uh, you might you might run into me from time to time, depending on depending on what we're doing here. So, um, prior to ServiceNow, I, I spent uh, most of my career actually in analytics and um, business intelligence, which was one of the reasons I ended up coming here to ServiceNow was to originally work with performance analytics and. Since then, uh, our, our duties have been expanded out to uh, agent intelligence, which I'm speaking about today, and uh, virtual agent as well. Um, you know, Chuck asked me for my hobbies, and that's always a tough one. I've gotten into home automation uh, most recently, kind of hooking my home up to, you know, lock and unlock doors, turn turn on and off lights, things like that. And then, of course, living here in California, you've got to drink a bit of wine and, you know, take do some hiking as well. So happy to be here and excited to be here for at the 59th episode of this. It's pretty awesome. <laughs> Hey, be careful about that home automation stuff, Matt. It's a slippery slope. <laughs> it's a yes, slippery it is. Slippery slope. I'm, 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 so I, I own a Wink Hub right now. If you happen to know what that is, and I'm actually looking at maybe even geeking out a little bit deeper with uh, with some of that stuff. So it's uh, it's it's a very very dark hole to go down, but I'm I'm kind of having fun with it. It's pretty cool stuff. Yeah, I have to it's talk to you sometime nice. about uh, how you can use service now to help automate that stuff too. I, I was, I, I, believe me, I've been thinking quite a bit about that. I, my, my, uh, my, my significant other would maybe like to have like a ticketing system that she could go in and say, hey, this thing isn't working anymore tonight. You know, let me go resolve that, right? So and I'm sure there's much more stuff you can do with it too. So. 
I can help you with that. We can even hook up Amazon Dash buttons, but another discussion for another time. That's awesome. I love it. That sounds fantastic. Let's do it. All right. Our agenda for this show is not about Amazon Dash buttons, as much as you'd probably like to hear about that. We're going to be talking about uh, – Craig's going to get us started with a quick tip. This is something we, we often pick from the community. It's just a real short topic. It's going to be talking about related list notation. There was just something that came up one day, and I said, why is this look like this? And does hmm. anybody else know this? So we're going to explain that. And then we'll get into Matt's topic. Remember, if you have a question, ask it in the Q&A box. If we don't get to it, sometimes these things have a massive backlog and we're not able to keep up, but we will answer those and post those to the community later. So we'll try to get to them as best we can. We're going to have Craig and Stacy and Chuck banging on the keyboard as fast as we can while Matt is doing his dog and pony show. And uh, you did bring a dog and pony, I hope, but that's the basic idea. Uh, we want to remind you about Knowledge. Knowledge Conference is coming up in Las Vegas, May 5th through 9th this year, and it is just a few short months away. We are, we are currently, we've extended the call for speakers. If you haven't done so already, there is a call for speakers link on that page, if I believe, knowledge.servicenow.com. If you've got an idea, you've got a story, you've got an implementation, you want to share that information, go there. I encourage you to submit that. Uh, knowledge is wonderful networking event, wonderful learning event. Get your hands on with all those instances. Craig is going to spin up. Someone's got to use them. You know, he doesn't just sit there and spin up instances for no apparent reason. If you want to learn about flow design, you want to learn about the platform, you want to get more about security and operations, there is, it's, it's the whole spectrum of ServiceNow applications and, and the suite and the implementation and just a lot of great information there including of course the keynotes and the parties and that that goes without saying with any conference somebody was asking me a question this morning and i went there first to say hey is the answer there already Sadly, in their situation, it was not, so I'm going to invite the uh, Success Center team to consider writing a best practice or an implementation white paper around that. In your service, or should I customize or configure, or you've been at this for like me, 10 years or more, and you want to know best practices around upgrading from London to Madrid when the time comes, or maybe you've got an older release and you want to get to London, it's all going to be in there for you. I encourage you to visit and visit often because the content is changing. So I'm going to fade into the background into the Q&A box and allow Craig to go on with his quick tip. All right. So this quick tip uh, is Pretty simple, so it only take a moment for me to show it to you, but it is a little helpful when you're trying to add related lists to your forms. So if you look here at the screenshot, you know, if you go through the motion of right-clicking on your form and do you configure to related list, you'll notice that there's a related list, of course, ta I'm sorry, a table, uh, tables are listed in the slush bucket on the left-hand side that you can choose from, of course, on the right, you have the tables that you've already chosen. But if you notice, like uh, the last one there, it says Todoist Project, and it says Tech Now Episode. Well, Todoist Project is the table that we're going to add, the related list. And the Tech Now Episode is actually the, it's showing you the field on the uh, related list that we're going to add that relates to the parent record that we're talking about. So you can get an idea if that's the right table maybe you're looking for you know, and make a decision of that's what you want to add. So that's the quick tip is right there. Why is that like that? Because it's showing you the table and then the what field is actually doing the relation. And I think, uh, what was that Chuck you were saying about the many to many table? It was like, I'm trying to remember now, uh, my mind went blank. Anyway, but you can get the idea about the uh, relationship. Yeah, so the, the, the short answer is the, the, if it doesn't have an arrow, it's a many-to-many -many table. 
That was it. That's what I was trying to you're showing, yeah. you're showing the field to table relationship. So it says the question table has an episode field on it. You see on the right hand side, there's an episode field that points to an episode record. And now you know how those are related right. because you may have multiple fields. For example, if you go into the incident table, you have a parent field that points to task and you have an incident task. And what was it? it was, there, was, there was another one that you, know, you could see hey, these, these kind of point to the same thing, but they may be labeled differently mm -hmm. in terms of the field names. Yeah. So it gives you a mapping, a, a visual indicator. I, I, I looked at this and went, wait, why do some have arrows and some don't? Oh, you know, that's a one-to-many, and that's a many-to-many. -many. So. Right. Well, there you go. And now we're going to pass it off and learn how we can work smarter with machine learning. I'm anxious to, to see this. Right. On to you. Cool. All right. There we go. Are you guys hearing me okay? Yes. Yes. Yes, we are. Excellent. Sounds good. All right. So I'm going to jump over to the poll question. And uh, we're going to start out with a poll here uh, for this section, so agent intelligence. And um, so the question is, how many assignment groups do you have in your organization's uh, incident management process? And if you wouldn't mind uh, giving us an answer here, I'll, uh, I'll move over here in just a second. Uh, but the, the, but the question, and really what we're, we're going to be focusing on here with agent intelligence, is getting into doing things like auto assignment, auto categorization, um, the, and, and really that's where uh, agent intelligence, sort of the out of the box agent intelligence, uh, focuses on. But you get to get an idea of, of, uh, of basically what so what folks are doing. Um, Chuck, tell me how quickly to move off of this slide. I forget uh, I forget what I was told. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, we're, we're waiting for people to give give them a, give them a minute or so to answer. Give them a minute uh, or so. All right. So yeah. we'll focus in on this. And I guess while we're doing that, I'll go ahead and talk to one of the slides that I'm going to be jumping up here on here in just a second. Um, and, and the reason for this, I, I'm I'm curious um, what what folks here on this call have because. Typically what we see, and, and, and there's going to be a, a paper that I'm referencing here in just a minute, but typically what we see uh, is people have well north of 100, 100 assignment groups. In fact, we have, uh, have some customers with upwards of 800 to 1,000 assignment groups, and then when it comes to categories, they have upwards of 50 to 100 categories as well. And so the, the process, and we'll, we'll talk, I'm jumping, jumping a little bit ahead of myself here, but the, you know, the process of going through and triaging and figuring out you know, as incidents come in, and, and that's the obvious use case for this. As incidents come in, um, you know, the, the triaging part of that, of where do we send these tickets, how do we categorize them, how do we assign them, that's, that's a, it's a real challenge for folks, and I'll, I'll talk to that here in just a minute. But uh, what do we think? Can we, can we go ahead and, and jump ahead here, Chuck? Yeah, I think so. I'm okay, curious to see what the so answers are. There we go. 34% of wow. the, the folks on here have 100 or more. Um, so that's a, and, and and that's really wow. representative. Gosh, the, the one that has less that's that less than twenty. That's that's that should make it actually pretty easy to, to do the to the job. But even with that, agent intelligence is certainly a, a useful useful uh, function nonetheless. So I'm going to jump ahead. So that, that's a, that's something good to keep in mind as we as we start to go through this. And again, uh, I, I mentioned this here just a minute ago. There is a uh, there's a paper that we have out, and we're going to have a uh, I think we have a link to it on one of the slides later uh, in this in this slide deck. Uh, that talks about this. It's a paper that Accenture wrote, and it was the, the paper was um, based on uh, some of our early users of agent intelligence and also some internal uh, polling that we did uh, at ServiceNow of our customers. And, and what we found um, was that the, the, the median, first of all, when it comes to assignment groups is 51. The mean is 805, some crazy number like that, right? So, so obviously, we have customers with a, a very large number of assignment groups on the, on the upper end. Um, and, and today, the typical thing that we see when we're talking to customers and, and when it's being implemented is our customers have, generally have sort of a frontline uh, service desk, and that service desk typically takes those incoming incidents, those incoming tickets, and they go through the process of triaging them. Uh, and mean that they go through the process of figuring out where should this be assigned to? Should this go to the software group? Should this go to the hardware group? Should this go to, you know, who should this go to? And how should we categorize the ticket as well? And it, again, if you read the paper, and I, I definitely would encourage you if you have time to read the paper, it's, it's a non-technical paper, so maybe it's not perfect for this audience, but it's still, I think it's actually a really fantastic paper. Um, Accenture comes to the conclusion that uh, roughly anywhere between 8% and upwards of 15 to 20% of time for frontline uh, service desk workers are spent very simply going through this categorization process. 
So it's a process that is, that is absolutely ripe for efficiencies, right? It's also a process that's ripe for automation. Um, and so ServiceNow, uh, a year ago, a little over a year ago, maybe a couple of years, in the last couple of years, um, we, we've made some acquisitions, and one of those acquisitions was a company called DX Continuum. And that has shown itself now as agent intelligence uh, inside of the ServiceNow platform. Um, and so what we're using this for initially in the initial use case is to do auto categorization, auto assignment uh, of tickets as they come in. Um, the idea here is, first of all, you're sort of eliminating the you're, you're eliminating that from the process that your, your frontline workers are having to deal with. So they're actually able to, to 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 work on the stuff that they really need to be working on, rather than sort of routing and, and sending things uh, different places. But you're also making your your requesters uh, happier as well because uh, their tickets are getting uh, resolved quicker. They're going to the right folks quicker, uh, and so on and so forth. I actually was reading an interesting uh, paper yesterday, um, Harvard Business Review uh, paper, and I, I throw Harvard Business Review out there to make myself sound smarter. I don't generally read those, but you know those things show up on LinkedIn from time to time. It was an interesting, interesting uh, conversation around uh, companies wanting to adopt machine learning and, and uh, artificial intelligence as, as quickly as possible, but it gets into talking about how difficult that can be. So one of the things you'll find with agent intelligence is it is a purpose-built machine learning or artificial intelligence uh, platform feature uh, here at ServiceNow. Uh, you don't have to go through the process of spending months on end to, uh, trying to do a science project. It's something that just comes out of the box and it just works for you. And the typical implementation time is roughly about three weeks as I understand it. So we'll move forward here. We'll talk about uh, how it's available. Um, so today it is available as a part of the ITSM, uh, CSM, HR uh, professional bundles as well as the HR, HRSM uh, enterprise bundle as well. Uh, it has been available since Kingston. You can see the roles there that are, that are available and then also the plugins as well. Um, one of the things I will point out is this is not, a, this is not available as a part of a developer instance. Uh, you'll understand this here in just a minute, but the reason for that is because the, the actual training for this doesn't actually happen on the, on the instance itself. There's actually a, a central training server where we do the, the trainings for these, and that's the reason it's not available uh, as a, on the developer instance. We'll keep moving here. So let's talk through exactly how this works. So again, as I just mentioned, um, Agent intelligence, it's, it's sort of a two-step process. The first thing we have to do is we have to go through the process of actually training your data that's coming out of your instance. Um, and that data gets extracted out to a raw data set and it gets sent to a training service. And that training service is within the, the four walls of, of service now. So it is a part of our cloud, but it doesn't actually take place on your, on your instance. And the reason for that is it's a, it's a pretty CPU intensive process. Um, when, we, when we extract the data, it can take roughly four to five hours to actually go through a training process. Obviously, you wouldn't want your, your, uh, your, your main instance being tied up doing that, doing that training. So we send that off to a training service. Um, that then gets converted into a, basically an, an, a, an analytical model, which then gets sent back to, to your instance, to the customer instance, essentially. talk through briefly what exactly happens. So when, that, when, the, when the raw data does get sent to uh, the training server, we go through a process of cleaning up that data. We go through and find any, any, any interesting characters that shouldn't be in there. Uh, and then we also go through, we maybe take, take some blanks out, things like that. And then we go through the process of, of, some, of de duping the data as well. So often uh, there may be machine generated uh, messages that are in there. So obviously we wanna sort of de duplicate that data. There's no reason to have those showing up in there over and over. Um, and then ultimately, it gets broken into what are called classes or class files. And the idea here is, is when you think about your assignment groups, let's say you've got 100 assignment groups, we think of each one of those as being a class in, in the parlance of, of agent intelligence. We essentially break those up into separate classes, and then there's essentially uh, models built for each one of those classes. So you might be thinking, and one of the questions that does come up from time to time is what's, what's really going on in the back end? How are you guys actually doing this process? You know, what sort of algorithms are you doing for this? So on the back end, we are essentially uh, breaking things up into what are called n-grams. And n-grams are a pretty common, a pretty common thing uh, that you can go and read about if you're interested. But essentially what we're doing is we're going through and breaking things up into one grams, two grams, three grams. So one gram is essentially breaking things up into single words. And then we break them up into to, uh, series of two words and then series of three words. And then that data gets essentially uh, put into well, basically what you could think of as a, as a big long row of data or a sort of almost like a database with, let's say, I don't know, let's say 10,000 columns. And it's not really that, obviously, but you can kind of think of, think of it that way. Um, and then what we're doing is we're, we're literally assigning equations 
or it actually turns it into a big equation, but we're, we're literally assigning, um, I guess you could say formulas for each one of these, these, these engrams. Um, and each one of these things essentially has a, a formula assigned to them, one gigantic uh, equation. Um, and then ultimately what we're doing is we're doing some logistic regression on this when we're actually doing those, uh, when we're doing those, uh, and I'm laughing here because Craig is sending through a message about doing this with the head Commodore 64 years ago. Sorry about that, Craig. I happened to glance up at the team chat. Uh, but anyway, it's, uh, it comes through, uh, it, it basically goes through, and then, and then that again, it gets sent, that, that analytical model gets sent back to, to your instance. So that's sort of the back end piece of it. And then the front end piece of it is the incidents start to come in. And as those incidents start to come in, uh, we have short descriptions. And what we're looking at, again, this is out of the box, and this, this can absolutely be changed, and I'll show you where, where, this, where this happens at, and you can build your own models even if you want to or your own solutions. But as the, as the incidents come in and, and, and the short descriptions come in, uh, essentially a business rule is fired off. The, the short description gets sent to the prediction API, which then runs it through that model that's been sent back to us. And then we go through and make a prediction based on that. So in this case, you can see that the prediction is it's being assigned to, let's say, the, uh, the email group and it's being categorized as software, or maybe vice versa on that. And we've got a, a confidence threshold, a uh, confidence uh, number, and then a confidence threshold that we've put on that as well. And then again, the, the ticket gets auto assigned. Now, there may be times actually where maybe something comes through in a short description that we haven't seen before. It doesn't look familiar enough. Um, and, and so we're not going to actually auto assign it at that point. At that point, it will actually go through to one of your agents to, to go ahead and do their process of, of uh, triaging and assigning that as well. So I, that's one of the questions that we get every now and again is what, what if it doesn't actually predict anything? And well, then it just goes through to somebody to, to do that prediction for you. So one of the questions I just saw come through from Stacy again, I gotta stop looking at that team chat, but this is a good question and I actually meant to mention this, so, so thanks for, for sending that through. One of the questions is uh, around uh, languages and that's a, that's a really great, great question. So um, out of the box, we support uh, six different languages. So English is the default and every single time you do one of these training processes, you, we're always gonna train it for English, but then currently out of the box in our London release, uh, we support Dutch, French, German, Japanese, and Spanish. And you'll go through the process, and I'll show this here in just a minute as well, of selecting a language, there's basically your secondary language uh, that you want to train as well. If you have multiple languages in there, let's say you have both French uh, and German or Japanese and Spanish in there, uh, along with English, uh, you'll, you'll, you'll never have to choose English, that just happens by default, um, but then you'll choose the primary language beyond that. And we'll, of course, uh, do predictions on the other languages as well, but you'll, you'll choose the primary language that you want us to do training on as well. So really the only decision you need to make once you've set your solutions up then is how do you want uh, each of these classes uh, to be covered and what do you want the precision to be? And, and so these are sort of the inverse of each other. The coverage is essentially uh, how many of these incidents do you want to cover and then how precise do you want it to be? So in other words, the more you cover, the less precise it is likely to be or the more precise it is, the less you'll cover. And what I mean by that is uh, if you set a precision threshold higher and higher, um, you just want to be much more precise about, am I right about this prediction or am I not? And if I'm not right about this prediction, then we want to make sure it gets sent off to somebody to, to, to do the actual triaging uh, so that you're not having to do reassignments or recategorizations on that as well. So at this point, I'm going to jump in and actually run through uh, a quick demo of the product, and then we'll, uh, we'll wrap things up here as well. So let, let me go ahead and share my screen. And there we go. So if somebody could let me know if they're seeing my screen okay. Looks good. Perfect. We'll keep moving here. Thank you. So really quick, going to run through a quick uh, process of, of uh, actually creating an incident. I'm going to use virtual agent. I know you guys just had a virtual agent session a month ago, so I'm going to, and, and again, because that's something that I also uh, work on these days as well. I'm going to do a, a quick virtual agent session. We're going to create an incident and we're going to sort of go behind the scenes and, and show the magic because this is actually a really quick process uh, as you can imagine. So I'm going to go ahead and create a ticket. I don't want to do a system status. I want to do a ticket. We're going to open up a quick IT ticket and there we go. So it's going to basically say, what's your issue here? So I'm going to basically type in here that says, I have an email issue. And so a virtual agent's going to come back and say, hey, here's some KB articles. Yeah, those aren't, those aren't good for me. I, I want to go ahead and say, no, they didn't resolve my issue. So, and then it's going to ask me, what's your, what's your urgency? It's always high, of course. And then 
from there, we're going to go ahead and create a, a, a ticket or an incident behind the scenes. What I want to point out here is very quickly, it auto-categorized it, auto-assigned that, that incident form. Let me just scroll back up and you can see that. So that all just happened instantaneously. When I sent that in, it actually took that, that, um, it took that short description that I, I, I put in there, and it actually turned it into an engram as well, and it basically went through the process of applying that engram against our model, and, and that's how it was able to decide. Uh, we want to be able to do, or we want to basically assign things to, to software and, and categorize it as software in this case as well. So let's go behind the scenes just so you know that I didn't, I'm not, uh, I'm not making this up. I'm going to just quickly refresh my screen. I've got my incidents, uh, my open incidents available to me here. Let me close that up. It was auto-assigned to software, and again, it was auto-categorized uh, auto -categorized to software as well. So again, that all just happened. I didn't have to run that through a service desk. There's nobody that had to go through that process. It was now routed to the correct assignment group to, to start to work on this, this issue that I have. So great. Let's have a look then at, at agent intelligence. Let's sort of have a look under the covers and, and see what's going on here. So I just typed in agent intelligence here in the search bar. We're going to my solution definitions. Out of the box, we have several solution definitions. Uh, specific to ITSM, we have incident assignment, uh, incident categorization. We also have them available for our CSM product and also for our HR products as well. They all sort of fall around the same, uh, the same idea of being able to auto-categorize uh, and auto-assign. So I'm going to jump into our incident assignment just so you can see what this looks like under the covers. Uh, it, it's not scary at all. It's actually, it's actually pretty easy to set one of these solutions up. Um, so again, out of the box, this is essentially what it looks like. And, and so what we're doing is we're basically saying, this is the data that we want to be sent off to do the training for us. And, and, and the training typically happens, let's say, once every 30 days or so. So you can see we've got a training frequency down here. You can choose, hey, I want this to, to be updated every 30 days, maybe every 60 days, whatever, uh, whatever you want to do that, but probably every 30 days. And you, you want to send roughly at least about, about 30,000 uh, records off to the, to the training. Um, you can go all the way up to 300,000 records, and so, uh, so you can send a fairly large set of data up there if you want to, or you can bring it all the way down to about 30. But you need about 30,000 records to really make a, a quality set of uh, training data, or to have a quality set of training data based on that. But here in our solution definition, we're essentially saying we want to point at the incident table, and these conditions must be met. So this is the data that's being sent off. So first of all, the, the incident itself is no longer fault, uh, no longer uh, active. And the reason for that is because we only want to send off incidents that have already been, uh, already been triaged, they've already been closed, and we know exactly the assignment group and the categorization they were closed with. Um, in, this, in this case, we're also saying, and the state is one of resolved or closed, um, and we're resolving it in the last three months, right? So we're looking at basically three months of data that we're sending off to our training server. So the question about uh, language as well. We always use English, and then you can choose a secondary language to train on in this as well if you want to. Uh, the languages for this are going to increase with time, but at the moment these are the, these are the additional five languages we have as of the London release. And then what we're saying from this is we want to look at this short description. This is our input field. And then our output field, in this case, is the assignment group. And again, if I went into the category, uh, if I went into the category solution, you'd see this as being category as well. But essentially what we're saying is let's look at the short description, let's look at everything that's been typed into the short description of all the incidents that we have out there, uh, and then based on that, we're going to choose the, the group that it's been, sent, been assigned to. Now this gets sent off uh, to our training server, and again, you know, a few hours later, uh, this training data gets, uh, basically goes through the process, it's, it's the, the, the model's built for it, uh, and then you essentially have what's called a built solution. So if I jump over here to my solutions, you'll notice that I have uh, several of these solutions that have been returned to me. Some of these are active and some of these are not. So you may go through the process of maybe sort of changing some things in your, uh, and, and maybe how you're identifying which data you want to look at. Uh, and then once that data does come back, we'll just quickly go into the, uh, we'll go into the assignment data, uh, one of the, so the, the assignment data that we're actually using. And when this comes back, you'll notice that we have an estimated solution precision of, of 94% and an estimated solution coverage of 96%. I will say this, this is, this is the demo data that we have, and so our, our solutions uh, coverage and precision is probably a little higher than what you're going to see in reality. But again, if you, if you think about, uh, if you take a look at what your typical reassignments are, uh, a lot of times we'll see customers that have uh, ticket reassignments of upwards of 40%, right? So that means that 40% of the time, uh, the folks that are assigning these are not getting it correct. So if, if you can at least hit the, the, the 60 to 70% of, of coverage and precision uh, with using agent intelligence, you're doing very well because it, essentially at that point, you've, you've sort of taken that person out of the process of doing that, and your agent intelligence is essentially achieving the same level of coverage and precision. So as I scroll down here, though, 
you'll notice again in my demo data, we've only got six classes here, so only six assignment groups. Again, this is, this is very clearly just demo data. Uh, but for each of these, we have the ability then to go in and say, okay, for my database assignment group, um, I can choose the precision and the coverage that I want with that. Um, there may be certain groups, so sometimes you have a catch-all group that you say, you know what, um, we probably don't want to send one of those catch-all assignment groups. Uh, maybe we don't want that trying to predict it at all, or maybe we want to have it much more precise because sometimes you can get some, some really interesting things coming in the short descriptions for, for that catch-all group. Um, so it depends on, on what you want to do. But it's, and you can, again, you can go back and you can tune this anytime you'd like. Uh, very easy to do. And really, that's all there is to it. There's really not a lot more to it uh, that, that, that happens here. It's a very easy process. Uh, to work through. You're not, again, having to spend a multi-month uh, sort of going through a, a science experiment and not knowing really what you're going to end up with on the other end. It's actually a pretty pretty simple thing. So as we continue to walk down through here, um, there's a few things that also happen, and, and I'll talk about this here in just a second. So we do have out-of-the-box reports. I'm going to talk about this when I actually show you the business rule. We do have out-of-the-box reports. Um, we do have things like prediction results, and this is actually a, a really interesting thing to look at as well. When you're looking at your prediction results, the idea here is, is that as you bring in a new training, initially you're probably going to see some, some very good prediction results. And as time goes on, that may start to trail off. And the reason for that is your business doesn't stay the same, which is the reason you want to go back and, and retrain these every 30 days. Things change. Your assignment groups might change. Your categorization might change. And so some of those prediction results might, might start to trail off. And that's a good indication that it's time to train again. So again, having that, that everyday, that, that 30 day uh, training schedule in there makes a lot of sense. And again, we can get into talking about uh, prediction usage as well. So from here, I'm gonna jump over now into the business rules because this also gives us an idea of, of what, there we go, jump into the business rules, gives us an idea of Oh, I'm blanking out. I knew that I was going to do this, Chuck. <laughs> what is the name of this? There we go. This is why I took notes. You can tell I don't jump into the business rules for this very often. Uh, this is where you can actually see what's going on behind the scenes with the business rules and how things are being sent off. So I, can, you'll notice that I went out here and searched for prediction. And when we bring in, in the prediction, you'll notice there's a few things out here. So first of all, we have the default uh, incident-based prediction, uh, and then we also have an update prediction result. So the default incident-based prediction in this case, this is what gets sent out. So this is what basically gets fired off when a new incident comes in. Um, essentially, uh, the incident comes in, the short description gets sent off to the, the, the default incident-based prediction. I'm going to jump in here really quick, and we'll, we'll just have a look at this. Uh, and this is what then sends it off to that prediction API. And so within here, we'll jump over to the advanced and we'll have a quick look at this. And so this is the, this is the, the script behind the scenes that's sending it off. Um, we go through a few things in here of determining, hey, what are, what are the various uh, solutions that are out there? But re really the thing that's important in here is the, the lower section of this, where we actually do send this off to the prediction API. Um, the prediction API is actually available for you to do other things with. And this is actually a conversation that uh, Chuck and I were having a few weeks ago. Of, you know, what else would, would folks want to make use of this prediction API for? Um, I could think of a few different things, you know, just you know, a few different things you might want to do. Um, you may want to sort of maybe call things a little bit differently. You might not, may, might not want to use specifically from maybe an incident form. Uh, you may want to use it just for helping out. So, for instance, you, you can actually call the, the, the prediction API and say, hey, if you were predicting what assignment group this should go to, what would that prediction be? And then you can actually still let the users actually make the predictions manually themselves if they really want to. So that is available out there for them to make use of. Um, you can absolutely come in here and make modifications to this business rule uh, if you'd like to do that as well. From here, um, again, once these predictions are being made in the very bottom section of this, we're also writing uh, that prediction to, a, to another, uh, basically a prediction results table. And the reason we do that is because we also, when, a, when an incident is closed, we also then do have an update prediction results uh, business rule as well. So as that, uh, as that incident gets closed, uh, another set of data, another piece of data gets written out that says, hey, for this incident, this is actually how we closed it. These are, these are the assignment groups that we actually chose. These are the categories that we actually chose or where, where things wound up. 
And how does that align with how agent intelligence predicted that? Now, as somebody that, that does analytics and does reporting, I love this. I love it when people are very explicit about these kinds of things. It's a lot easier than sort of having to go back and sort of trying to infer from the data, uh, you know, how well we did with our predictions. So we're being very explicit about this, of actually writing that information out to a table. And if you go back to the statistical results that I was showing previously, um, those, are, uh, those are basically coming from that table. So it makes it very easy for you, again, to be able to see, hey, this is how we're doing with this, and you can make usage of that uh, to go from there. Now, one of the things you might say is, hey, we, we got the model back. We want to test out um, how, is, how well is that model working for us. And so I'm going to go to our, uh, our REST API Explorer. And within the REST API Explorer, uh, you can essentially go in and have a look at the agent intelligence uh, API in here. So we'll go ahead and choose the API, uh, agent intelligence API. I'm going to close my screen down here just a little bit. Uh, the solution name in this case is, is that ML is the, the incident uh, solution that I had out there. So let me just type this in really quick and see if I can see how my spelling goes today. So ML incident assignment is the name of that solution, and I'm going to add a query parameter. The, the query parameter is short. I should have this open in another window so I don't have to type here. And again, uh, I could type in that same phrase that I put in e earlier. I'm just going to type in the word email. Um, we're going to go ahead and send this off. And this is now sending that off to that to, to the API, and we can see the uh, we can see the results of that. So by sending in in the word email. Uh, the output in this case is we're assigning it to the software group in this case, right? And again, if we did this with, uh, with looking at the, uh, not the assignment group, but if we did that looking at the categories, uh, it would again come back with probably that email uh, categorization as well uh, and what the prediction on that is as well. So I'm going to stop there. Um, I am trying to, let's see, from here, looking at my slides above, I'm trying to remember now. I was going to show any more slides. I think. Matt, you got a minute for a question? Yeah, we've got plenty of time for questions. I was going to say, do we want to roll into some questions here? Sure. A uh, couple of questions around the assignment rules and agent intelligence. Do you know which runs first, and are those compatible, complementary to each other? What's the relationship there? Well, that's a good question. So certainly, I'm, I'm sure you could certainly use those. I don't, you know, so Chuck, that's a great question in terms of uh, which comes first. Um, I think I think you probably, that's a, I don't know the answer to that question, but what I do know is that a lot of times um, assignment rules can essentially be replaced by uh, agent intelligence. Uh, in my mind, now there, there could be a usage of having those, those guys out there uh, together, but in my mind, uh, it really um, agent intelligence uh, is probably a good replacement for it. And the reason for that I hear, I hear this question come up from customers of, hey, we've got all these fantastic assignment rules out there. Um, it doesn't make sense for us to use agent intelligence. And my question usually back to them on that is, well, how much time are you spending actually maintaining uh, those assignment rules? Is there a lot of work being put into that? Is there a lot of your time being put into maintaining those assignment rules, right? Um, and, and, and realistically, the answer is usually, yeah, it takes, it takes time to keep that stuff going. And, and as the business changes, you're, you're having to constantly update those. So, wouldn't you rather have in the background that just sort of happening automatically for you? Um, and usually the answer is yes, I think I would rather have somebody automatically doing that for me than having to maintain those assignment goals manually myself. Um, so yeah, it's a good question. Okay, and it's, it's primarily for the assignment group or could you do the assign to as well? It's, it's primarily for the assignment group at the moment. So we, we're able to predict okay. upwards of, of 50 classes at the moment. Um, and, and so you generally will have more assigned tos than, than those 50 classes. And so it usually makes sense to do uh, at an assignment group level. You certainly could do the assigned to level. It's just a matter of, you know, how many, how many uh, workers do you potentially have that being assigned to? So it probably makes more sense to do it at the assignment group level, especially because you have multiple, multiple workers working for the same assignment group. So it might be difficult to sort of make those predictions unless you have sort of a one-to-one -one in your assignment groups of, of assignment groups to, to users. All right, looking through the other ones. Um, is this available for self-hosted? Ooh, the answer to that is today, the answer is no. Uh, I don't know if that's something that we're looking at doing in the future, but at the moment the answer is this, this, this does have to be hosted by ServiceNow. Okay, so the it, interesting. I would have thought, you know, if we're exporting the metadata, sending that off to the training instance, and coming back with a model, 
there, uh, there must be some interaction that we're doing between those automatically. It's not okay. Yeah, that, that yeah, and, and, yeah, and the reason for it is because it's because we are doing because the the training the training server is inside of the ServiceNow uh, cloud um, and it is not exposed to the outside, so there's not a way to, to sort of uh, there's not a way to sort of push that that model into the ServiceNow cloud to those training servers. So that that's the reason for that. Um, okay. I've heard rumors of other things that may happen down the road, and we'll get back to it. Okay. So I'm going to push the. Uh, we'll jump back to the to the slides if that if that makes sense. And let me know if you're seeing those slides now. I need to end my screen share. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. If you could uh, stop you your go. screen share. There you go. There you go. There we go. We got it. Awesome. So some additional learning. Um, there's some links to uh, agent intelligence uh, out there. Again, that Accenture study that's out there, and there's also a CIO white paper that talks about uh, leveraging uh, agent intelligence within your uh, within your ServiceNow uh, instance uh, and solution. And then some additional uh, reference information uh, out there as well. And I think at this point, Chuck, am I handing this back to you now? You are indeed. Thank you. Okay. So just want to remind is uh, people don't leave. We still have some questions that are in the queue. Stacy's going to look them over and uh, see if we've got anything that we can answer. Matt, can we put Matt on the hot seat one more time because we've got a few minutes and I want to make sure that's valuable for you. But before we leave, I want to remind you that we do have some additional reference information. Please go to docs.servicenow.com if you want to learn more about agent intelligence, what it is, get the inside skinny, talk to your account team, your ServiceNow account team, if you're interested in taking a look at it, trying it out, test driving it. The community is a great place for questions about all things ServiceNow. I encourage you to check that out. Here I am using my arrow keys, thinking that I'm going to move something here, but not PowerPoint. <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, I encourage you, invite you to go to developer.servicenow. Get a free personal developer instance. As Matt mentioned, unfortunately, agent intelligence is not available on the free personal developer instances. You're going to have to do that on your organizational information because you've got that legacy data built up, you know, there's 30,000 or more records that you can use to build a generous model and, and get some reliability out of that. But for everything else, almost everything else, the, the uh, developer portal is a wonderful site to learn, experiment, do proof of concept, wreck things, wipe it out, start over. I use it all the time for that kind of thing. And we do have, as I mentioned, I'm going to have to update this slide. It says over 50 topics. Uh, we've been doing this for quite a while, so when you get to the survey about other topics that you'd like to see, don't forget to scan the list over at uh, that bit.ly link of topics we've already done in the past. Someone said, hey, I'd like to see something on the REST API. We did the REST API about four years ago. <laughs> it, it's been a yeah. while, and uh, it still holds up. I watched that video recently. It's still pretty good. Hey, uh, script you still get API. feedback on your jelly one, don't you? Yeah, uh, yeah, we still get feedback on the jelly videos from five years ago. It, yeah. It's still out there letting jelly code. And yeah. as always, I remind you to go to the Success Center. So if we don't get to your questions and answers, it's not because we don't like you. We love you very much. We want to make sure that you get this. We will be posting this to the community in a couple of days. We need to get the Q&A back and process it, answer those questions, et cetera, et cetera. There's a bit of post-production that goes on with this webinar. So be sure to stay on the lookout. Go to that Bentley link. You'll see Episode 59. Click through to that. If it's got the questions and answers there, we're done. If it doesn't, we're still working on it. So hmm. my goal is to get that to you by the end of this week, which is December 14th. If you're watching this sometime in 2019, 20 or beyond, consider it done. So let's see. Are there any additional questions, Stacy, that you'd like to throw at Matt? Yeah, there are a couple in the queue uh, that I think would be very interesting to discuss in the time that we have remaining. A couple of them are a little bit forward thinking, uh, but one simple one is, can you force the solution training for a smaller data sample? I think we mentioned kind of we're looking around 30,000 records to train, but is it possible to train on smaller data sets? It, it is possible, um, and, uh, and that's a great question. I want to say, that the, and I could be wrong about this, we would need to double check on this, but I want to say that the minimum is, I want to say it's 10,000 records. I could be wrong about that. If for some reason, that, that number is coming to my mind. Um, but you do, you obviously do need to have a, a, a significant, enough data there for, for it to be able to make um, some good predictions off of. But you can definitely do less than 30,000. It's just the question is going to be, is, is how useful is that then going to be from there? 
Um, and I think the answer to that is probably the fewer classes you have, so the fewer assignment groups or the fewer categorizations you have. Um, I'm, and this is just me making an assumption because I've not done a training set in a small, small set of data, but I would assume with a smaller, smaller set of classes that it's going to be more accurate, obviously. But if you've got a large number of classes for that, then it's going to be tough to do that or tough, tough for it to, to really work for you, if that makes sense. Yeah, and that kind of leads us into the second question here. Uh, you had mentioned that it can handle up to 50 classes. Does this mean that a, for assignment groups, it's only going to 50 groups? I think we're probably dealing with kind of a Pareto diagram where we get the 50 most common. But can you address exactly. that, please? Yeah, that's it, and that's exactly what it is. So we're gonna we're gonna work with the 50 most common assignment groups um, in this case, and, and generally that's that's generally um, perfect for what people are doing. You sort of tend to get that long tail of the other 300 assignment groups that that really get chosen. So generally the 50 assignment groups uh, we're using we're, we're working with the top 50 assignment groups or the top 50 categories, and that generally covers it's sort of the 80-20 rule. It's generally going to cover roughly 80% of the of the tickets that come through. Great, and then um, finally we'll see how much time we have left. Uh, can we train on a sub-prod instance and move those uh, solutions to our prod instance? Can you talk about yeah. some of the best practices on where to train and how to promote those solution definitions? Yeah, that's a great question. So it, it's definitely, uh, definitely you can do that. You can definitely uh, move your solutions up. Um, they are able to just simply be exported out and then taken over to your production system. Um, and that's a, that's a great way of doing it, right? Because obviously you, you want to do a training in your sub-prod um, and then test it out. You saw me testing it out with the with the REST API and going in there and, and doing that, or even even maybe manually creating some incidents and seeing what happens as you as you do that. See if it's working the way you're expecting it to work. Uh, you certainly do want to go through a bit of a bit of testing, obviously, to see how that works. Uh, when you're satisfied with that, then you can absolutely then promote that up to uh, production, um, and it is simply just the process of going through and exporting those uh, exporting those out. Um, I've not actually done the export. I want to say it, it's essentially. Uh, well, I'm not going to. I'm not going to get into that too much. I, I've not done it, but it, it is essentially uh, supposed to be a very easy process. So I, as I understand, it's a pretty easy thing to do. And I think one I of the very important things that you just mentioned is that the reason for training on subprod is that you can test out the solutions. Uh, we're not introducing any extra processing load on the instance since the data is being analyzed and. Uh, trained on a separate yep. environment inside the ServiceNow yep. data center. So yep, that's absolutely. Important. And, yep, and like I said, the, the distinction obviously, the developer instances, you can't necessarily do training there, but uh, in your sub-prod you absolutely can. So you can clone it down, you can you can then send that data off in your sub-prod and, and, and you know, test it out. But you're, you're absolutely right. There's, there's, in either way, there's no, you're not doing the training processing on your local instance. So even if it's your production server, you're not you're not giving it a you're obviously not giving it a processing hit when the uh, when the training happens. We're we're taking care of that off off instance for you. And then finally, there's a lot of interest around the longer term goals and direction for agent intelligence going beyond just incident management and looking at things like knowledge management, determining criticality, et cetera. Yeah, I, uh, I Chuck, I ha how, 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 how much of that am I allowed to talk about? I don't know what the rule, what are the rules of engagement here on these webinars? Um, we, we definitely have to start coming. <laughs> uh, uh, if it, yeah, there's, there's a safe harbor thing that uh, we, we definitely want to share that information. I don't know if this is the proper venue to do that yeah. uh, as, as, you know, anything we say should not influence future purchasing decisions, blah, 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 make the lawyers happy, yeah. that kind of thing. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, just at a, a really high level, I think the some of the questions that uh, that just came up, right? Some of the, some of the things that were just mentioned there in the questions, um, those are some those are some really good ideas. Let's just say those are some really good ideas of, of what can be done. Um, and there's some 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 other interesting stuff coming uh, in. You know, let's say Madrid and and going forward from Madrid as well. But our, our next release Madrid. Um, which is sort of in the process of our, you know, we're going through our, the, the, the QA process right now, the beta process right now of that, and there's some really interesting stuff that's coming in that. Um, I would say certainly be on the lookout for when we get in and start doing the webinars of what's coming in Madrid because there's some really interesting stuff that's coming in there or is planned to come in there, shall we say. Um, and uh, I think your, your agents will be happy with that as well as some of the other, some of the other folks that, uh, that, that uh, um, use and, and administer a ServiceNow platform. And if I'm not mistaken, our, our Madrid 
Tech Now is February 26th, if you want to mark your calendars. I'm going to give you that yeah. forward thinking there. So, uh, Matt, thank you. It has been... yeah. Go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, there's always a ton of stuff new that comes in, but if, if you happen to manage to get the agent intelligence stuff in there, there's some really cool stuff that's, that's coming with some other parts of ServiceNow in Madrid, so we're really excited about it. Excellent. Yeah, it is a product we are continually investing in. It's not just like we made the acquisition, we put it in platform, and we walked away. Obviously, there are some use cases that fit well, where you have high volume and you're spending time triaging them. I was doing a demo for uh, a safety application where the safety department can you know, take, uh, take and track their records in ServiceNow, and somebody said, hey, can we use that with agent intelligence? And I looked at them and said, if you have a company that has 30,000 safety issues, I might look for another place to work. <laughs> <laughs> good point. Think about what you're asking very, for. <laughs> that's a very good point. Very good point. All right, Matt, thank you very much. You have been a wealth of information, and uh, we'll definitely loop you in on any unanswered questions. I'm sorry we weren't able to answer all of them. They will be made available on the community, as I, see, as I mentioned earlier. Thank you, everybody, for joining us here today. Uh, thank you, Stacy and Craig, for, for your help uh, on the, on the uh, quick tip and the background info. Uh, lots of great stuff. So with that, we are done and look forward to talking to you in January on our next episode. Thank you very much.